discuss that. All right, uh, sexual harassment. A couple things on sexual harassment. If I go to my secretary tonight or tomorrow at work and I say, hey, Maxine, um, you want to go out uh, for a date on Friday? And she says, you mean like a meeting? Actually, she's Irish, so she says it's really cool Irish accent. You know, you mean like a meeting or something like that? And I would go, no, a date. And she'd go, ah, James, that's awkward because, you know, you're married and I'm married. And no, uh, we're not going to do that. I say, okay. And I go back to work. Is that sexual harassment? No, that's not sexual harassment. If I ask her again on Monday and on Tuesday and Thursday and Friday and for the next couple of weeks, yeah, that's like, dude, take a hint, shut up. That's, that's sexual harassment. Or if I'm commenting on what she looks like consistently. If she comes into work and I say, hey, Maxine, uh, I like your pantsuit. That's fine. If I'm commenting on what she's wearing every day when she walks in, that's not so fine. Um, so it, it's kind of, it, it's a bit, it's a bit difficult to nail down exactly uh, what it is. There's certain things that are clear. Like if you slap somebody on the butt, yes, that's not just sexual harassment, that's sexual assault at that point. If you say, uh, hey, if you sleep with me, I'll give you a raise. Yes, that's called a quid pro quo. That's illegal sexual harassment. Uh, but you can see there's a big, there's a lot of, there's a lot of gray areas. But there is two uh, specific types I uh, certainly want you to be aware of. One is quid pro quo. It's a Latin term that just means this for that. And the other one is a hostile work environment. The one that um, uh, people are probably most familiar with is the hostile work environment. And that is, um, you're, <laughs> I, was, uh, I was getting, I had a, a TDI, a turbo diesel Volkswagen Jetta several years ago. And I uh, took it into the mechanic shop and I wanted to speak to the mechanic who was in it. It was his back room, you know, a bunch of cars up. And the lady from the, the counter, like call service, whatever, I said, can you take me back there? I can, I can go see this guy. I want to talk to him. So we walked back there and she's in like, you know, high heel skirt, professional, professional appearance. And she walked in and that place lit up like fireworks. Um, they were hooting and hollering and everything. And I asked her, I said, does that bother you at all? She says, oh, no, you know, it's kind of cute. Is that sexual harassment? In that moment, the answer is no, it's not. Because the definition of sexual harassment is unwanted sexual advances. And she said, no, I kind of like it. And I got to thinking, like, all it takes is for her one day to wake up and go, that's not okay. Like, that bothers me at work, and I can't focus on my job, so stop. And then it becomes sexual harassment quickly. Uh, so that's a hostile work environment. Jokes, touches, whatever. A quid pro quo um, usually doesn't happen clearly. It's almost always a male supervisor and a female subordinate. It can go both ways. Sexual harassment is... Same gender, same level, cross level. I mean, you can, any customers, suppliers, people coming in, owners. So anybody can kind of sexually harass anybody and have it be sexual harassment. Most of the cases are male supervisors, female subordinates. And if a male supervisor says uh, uh, to a female subordinate, like, like, do you want to go on a date? Or I think you're cute or whatever, or tries to kiss her. She's in a situation like, do I kiss him back as my boss? And, and that person decides my salary and my promotion. So there's a lot on the line here. So the, the manager never said, hey, uh, you know, make out with me or let's hook up and, you know, Netflix and chill and you're going to get a raise or a promotion. Like, it was never actually said, but just by the nature of their position, right? A supervisor and a subordinate, it was implied. So a lot of managers thinking, gee, I think she really likes me, just get roasted on this because they're not seeing the power differential um, and, and the implications of it. That's, um, that's a quid pro quo. There's more to it than that, but that's kind of a rough summary. All right, so what do we do about it? Obviously, I have a sexual harassment policy. Um, the biggest mistake that firms make is not asking enough questions. If, if there was like, if it was like a, if it looks like it's a relationship, dive in, be like, hey, Everything okay there? Like, are you comfortable with it? You don't have to say, you know, tell me your darkest secrets about how you feel. But like, are you comfortable with what's going on? If they say yes, it's great. Um, but if there's an allegation or a complaint of sexual harassment, like this, this would be my, my advice, like, like young managers, especially young might be the wrong word, inexperienced managers, young in their career, and and HR people is when somebody, when somebody's going to make a complaint about sexual harassment, you've already been trained that you have to take that seriously. You, you need to investigate. you got to figure it out, take disciplinary action, etc. But very rarely, matter of fact, um, I don't know if it's ever happened uh, to me in my career where someone has come up and said, I'd like to file a claim of sexual harassment. I believe it was hostile work environment and violated the civil rights law of 19... No, 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 no. It's, it's going to be like this. Someone going, yeah, I think he likes me. It's kind of awkward. 
done. Like that's your cue to be respectful and respect privacy, but you need to pry in and figure out, is this a hot, is this a hostile work environment? Do you feel like, like you don't want to go to work? Like work sucks because every time you show up, you get flirted with. Is that is that what's going on? Well, what happened after work? And you finally said yes and went out for drinks. And then, okay, so what happened there? So my, my point is, if it even brings it up, it's kind of awkward or I'm kind of uncomfortable or something like, yeah, he asked me out and he's my boss, obviously. So I said yes. Like any of those, that's your cue to go. All right, we got we to gotta figure out, make sure everybody's comfortable with what's happening. Because if not, um, you're looking at sexual harassment and probably a hurt employee. And maybe a manager who needs to be retrained to understand a few boundaries. Okay, uh, disabilities. Most people know about the ADA. That's why uh, if you are a builder, you have all kinds of uh, uh, codes, uh, building codes and wheelchair ramps and elevators and, and all, all that kind of stuff. That came from the ADA, but one particular section of the ADA um, is about discrimination against people with uh, disabilities and um, what's called reasonable accommodation for, for how we, we deal with that. Is enforced by the EEOC. Someone is considered disabled. They have one of three things: physical or mental challenge that greatly reduces the ability to perform or important life functions. So, like the buzzword here is, it limits a major life function. Um, if you are, if you have uh, diabetes, your pancreas doesn't work. That's a life function. Um, maybe asthma. You can't breathe or sleep apnea. You can't sleep or uh, 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 you're a uh, uh, legs amputated you can't walk I mean like anything that you go say an important life function or a major life function if you have anything glasses seen if you can't see without glasses under the the ADA AA which is the update you are considered a person with a disability so that's number one it's very broad number two possesses a record of such a challenge meaning yeah I used to be uh, overweight and I had sleep apnea I use that example because that was an employee that I had um, but I lost 150 pounds and now I don't have sleep apnea anymore. Well, that's just fine. But if performance, if the person is continually falling asleep at work and stuff like that, just because a person says, I don't have sleep apnea, there's a record, there's a history there that suggests it might be something else happening. So that person would immediately kind of be considered as having a disability, even if they say they don't. Um, the last one is thought to have such a challenge. I had a situation with an employee where their their his wife was emailing me saying something's not right, something's not right. Like I think it could be this, I think it could be this. Wasn't even a note from the doctor. I I then take that and go somebody is considered to have such a challenge. So now that kicks in uh, the next step, which is called an interactive dialogue. Warren, I noticed you fell asleep. Yeah, yeah, I was just up late. I'm tired. Okay, let's talk about that. Like 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 how can I help you? Is there anything I can do? And if he's not getting it, am I even use the word like? Is there an accommodation? That's a buzzword people usually know. Is there an accommodation I can make for you? And it's like, oh, I see where you're going here. So that is a, a required conversation that we have called the interactive dialogue. And then you figure out what are the main essential job functions that you have um, and what are some ways we can reasonably uh, accommodate you. For one of the guys, the sleep apnea guy, it's just what's fresh in my head right now. Uh, it was an alternative work shift. So rather than just working eight hours straight through, uh, he did three hours, whatever it was, three hours, and then uh, a two-hour break. He would go and go swimming, come back and do three more hours, take an hour break and go for a walk, and then come back and finish the last hour. Made for a long work day. He was exercising. He was healthier, fit with his family situation. Just an alternative work schedule. Like It wasn't a crisis. There's a lot of different ways you can make accommodations, but that's it. What are the essential job functions? And then how do we figure out how to accommodate someone to get them qualified for those particular job functions? And in some cases, we can't. Uh, we can't do it. So let's say there's a Victoria's Secret model uh, who is uh, in her backyard with a chainsaw, which is kind of weird, but let's just go work with me on this. And they're cutting the end, and she cuts one of her legs clean off. Okay? Um, a prosthetic leg for a Victoria's Secret model may not work anymore. Um, so we go, there actually isn't a reasonable accommodation. I guess they have like airbrush stuff. I don't know. You get my point here. There are certain things, there are certain disabilities that happen that are so pervasive or in such a way, usually as a result of trauma that says like, I can love you, think you're great, but you actually can't have this job anymore. There is no accommodation we can make for you. Or for instance, the accommodation would be such an undue hardship on the business 
it wouldn't make sense to even maintain business operations anymore. That was really kind of a messed up example, but I, I hope I hope you're still with me uh, on that. That's an undue hardship. We don't need to go through each of these. The bottom line is get creative on if someone has a disability, you have the dialogue and they're willing to say, yeah, I'll work with you to get an accommodation. There's a lot of different uh, ways you can accommodate. And there is no place in the law where you go, well, we tried this one accommodation and it didn't work, so we fired them. No, that's called uh, discrimination, <laughs> disability discrimination. So try to be creative and create solutions. Again, sometimes you can't, but those are rare. Usually there's usually there's something to do. All right, age discrimination. Uh, don't discriminate against people over the age of 40. I would say don't discriminate anyway based on age. Uh, it's probably not the, the, the big thing you should be caring about when you're hiring for talent. Uh, religious discrimination. This one, this one blows up a lot. Um, there is constantly in the news, there's um, kind of identity politic uh, uh, kinds of stories that try to stir people up, certainly divide them by way of religion. And so you have, you have those uh, employees who see the news and come to work. And you have uh, you know, the, the devout Jewish guy next to the devout Muslim guy next to the devout Catholic guy all having lunch together in the cafeteria. Like what could possibly go wrong, right? Um, so it's something we train our, our managers on, um, how to have, how to have meaningful, authentic conversations that are, that are respectful, um, different form challenges of inclusivity. But, uh, the big picture title seven laws of 1964 is you don't discriminate based on religion. The question is, can the person do the job? Are they the most qualified for the job? The question is not where do they go to Sabbath or synagogue or wherever on the weekends? Uh, the question is who's the best at the job? Uh, Immigration Reform Control Act, 1986, I believe. Big part of this is you have 72 hours as an HR person to um, document two things from anybody who you hired to company. Number one, identity. They are who they say they are. And number two, uh, work authorization. They're legally authorized to work in the United States. A lot of people hear that and they say, okay, so I need their driver's license um, and uh, proof that they're a citizen. No, there's lots of different ways people can work legally in the United States without being citizens. You have to document work authorization, meaning they're legally authorized to work in the United States. You have 72 hours to do that. Um, you will probably have one or more I-9 audits in your life. The I-9 is the form that's completed. Uh, these are the forms, potential forms, sources of information employees can bring in where you document those two things. Um, at some point, you will probably have an audit. I recommend, uh, usually for companies, certainly over 50 employees, you do your own I and I audit uh, once a year. So you have somebody, it shouldn't take more than a day, go through, make sure you have all the right information for every employee who's there. If there's anybody missing, go collect the information. What you don't want is to be found in violation of the Immigration Reform Control Act uh, for, certainly during an investigation. In general, it's a good idea to follow the law, right? Um, but if someone uh, makes a complaint or and there's an audit, uh, you need to be able to produce each of these each of these I-9 forms and the appropriate documentation. This shows, A, the person who you hired is actually the person you thought you were hiring. That's their identity. And then, B, they're legally authorized to work in the United States. Uh, can you fire people because you think they're fat and ugly? Yeah. I mean, fat and ugly is not a protected category, but you got to be really careful about that. Uh, the EEOC will say, no, you can't because it's not job-related. And you say, well, we hire models. Okay, maybe it's job related. Uh, or we hired, we fired this person because they weren't like the look of the company was going for. Well, the last three people that you did that to, two were black, one was Hispanic. You haven't fired any white people because they weren't the look. That kind of seems like race discrimination. Or that guy got too fat to do his job, so we fired him. Well, that guy is clinically obese, which is a disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So you just discriminated against a guy with a disability. So in general, uh, like don't mess with it. If it's a business necessity, if it's a BFOQ, well then yes, of course. Uh, but in general, you're not so concerned with how someone looks or how big or small they are in terms of weight. Um, there are certain situations like if I want to be a pilot and I'm four foot three, well, airplanes probably aren't made for me. Or if I want to be a pilot and I'm seven foot two, cockpits probably aren't made for me to sit in. So there's certain things where we go, sorry, man, you're too tall, you're too short, you're too fat or too skinny. But those are generally those are generally pretty rare. 
Um, so whatever requirements you put on there, of course, need to be specific to the job functions themselves. So all that said, we covered about one third of the ways where you could get sued and uh, screw stuff up. And more importantly, uh, from an ethical perspective, be unfair and unjust to people, uh, which we don't want to be doing. So that was my quick EEO talk. Could have gone for about four more hours. We're going to leave it there. In sum, use job-specific criteria on every employment-related decision. Who gets a raise? Who gets laid off first? Who gets hired? Who gets fired? Who gets promoted? Who gets to go on this trip with a CEO? Who gets to be in the managerial training? Whose MBA are you going to pay for? Just make sure they're job-specific uh, criteria down the line. And with that, have a great day. I'll see you in the chapter three.